I'm going to share my screen. Oh, wait a minute. Share my screen. Hold on. There it is. Okay. Can you hear me? I can. can. And I'm okay. assuming you can hear me. Hear me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I can start off with a lecture if you like. Um, sure. This is the wrong lecture. Close that. This is the right lecture. And then stop me if you have. No, that's not the right lecture either. I know lecture six is open. There we go. Um, so feel free to ask me any questions as we go through this. Okay. Okay. So this week we're talking about data structures, and that's what lists and dictionaries are. They're data structures. They're a way to structure our data to make it more usable, because all programs are data data driven. Whether you're talking about um, Instagram, or whether you're talking about Pinterest, which is actually written a lot in Python, or you're talking about your text-based games, all of them require data structures so you can organize your data well. So there are two basic data structures in Python. There's lists, and there are dictionaries. Um, and this table shows the difference. Lists are ordered, mutable, and have an index value. Dictionaries are unordered, mutable, and they map keys to values, and there is no index in a dictionary. So those are the things to keep in mind when you are selecting the type of data structure that you want to use. And there are definitely different uses for lists and for dictionaries. Sometimes lists are better, sometimes dictionaries are better. It all depends on what the data you have is and what problem you're trying to solve. So we have some new symbols this week. We have the open and closed square brackets, and we have the open and closed curly brackets. Square brackets are used for a list. Curly brackets are used for a dictionary. So that's the basic difference. If you're square bracket, you're going to have an, an ordered list with an index. If you are curly brackets, you're going to have an unordered list with key value pairs. So we're going to talk about CRUD tonight. We did a little bit of that in strings, but now we're going to talk about create, read, update, and delete. You couldn't update a string. You had to create a new string. But in this case, we are going to be able to update the list. So we have C-R-U-D, create, read, update, and delete. So here is a basic just screen of the difference for a list. A list can be created in two ways. It can be created as an empty list or an unpopulated list, which is just the open and closed square brackets with nothing in between. I know sometimes this slide, people think there's a space there. There is not. It's just an open square bracket and a closed square bracket. And that just tells Python, here's an empty list. It's all you're saying. Now, why would you want an empty list? Because some point in the future, when less, let's say a user gets an item for their game, you're going to populate this list. And then we have a populated list. So those are the two ways to create a list. You can create it empty. You can create it with something. Okay, in this case, I've said Lisa 42 and 3.14. Doesn't matter what's in it, as long as there's something in it, it's considered a populated list. Now, this really isn't a big deal because you can update a list. You can modify it in place, unlike a string, where, where a string is kind of a list, but you can't, like, change a letter in a string. You have to create a whole new string with that letter in it. True list you can change things. So read. Read is how I'm going to get data out of my list because 
The sole reason for a list to exist is to hold data. So what can I do? I can access data in the list by using the index number. This is the same thing we did with strings. I could get a value, I could get a character from a string based on the index of when it was in the string. I can do the same thing for a list. A string is a list without the ability to update. So everything you can do with a string, you can do with a list, but you can actually do a little more with a list. Okay, the other way to access data in a list is using a loop, okay? So in this for loop, and we're gonna talk a lot more about for loops in a little bit. For this for loop, I have four elem in my list. Now you'll notice there's no range here. I didn't say in range my list because I don't have to. Unless I need that index number, I can just have the for loop go in and grab the next element for me and then do something with that element in the list. So that's one of the reasons for loops with the in operator are made for lists. You just, it's very seamless. All right, I can update in place. I don't have to create a new list. I can pull something out of the list and I can put something back in. So the, the way to replace an element is simply to say the name of the list, open square bracket, the number of the index, close square bracket, an equal sign, and a value. It's very much like a variable. The variable's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign and you have the value on the right. In this case, what takes the place of a variable is the list with the index number and the correct brackets around it. So I can also add to the end of a list. I can say my list dot append and I can just plop something on the end. I can do that as many times as I want until I fill up my hard drive or my, the RAM in my computer. So that's two ways to update a list. You just change out an element or you use a function. And there are many more functions on the list, on lists. And down here on the bottom of the slide, I have a, um, a link to the python.org and it talks all about data structures. And if you go to that page, you will see there's a lot of stuff that we don't even begin to get into in this class because there's too much that, that is just about list management. And I can also take the first element off of the list, so I can pop it. So it's just like a, um, a Pez dispenser. If you, if you know of the old Pez dispensers, you could pop a um, Pez out of the dispenser. So in this case, you can pop a, an element off the top of the list. So it would be at index zero that you would be removing from the list. So delete. You can delete an element in a list. In this case, I'm going to delete my list at index value of two. Or you can delete the whole thing. The del is a keyword. Oh, I should have put that in the keywords. I'll have to go back and do that, sorry. Del is a keyword, it means delete, and you can delete an element or you can delete the whole thing. Sorry, I had to take a glass of water. So, we just talked about create, read, update, and delete, and that's what we're going to do. That's what challenge 6.1.1 does, and we'll go over and look at the code in just a moment. So. I'm Professor Lisa. I'm typing something in because the, com the computer has asked me to. My Python program has said input something. And in this case, I'm going to input Gertrude, Sam, Anne, and Joseph. Now I want to create a list from Gertrude, Sam, Anne, and Joseph. And I do this by using the split operator. I've used the split operator before in strings. Now I'm using it with a list. So, sorry, not the split operator, the split function. So with the split function, I'm saying my delimiter is a comma. So what Python will do is it will take everything in user input. It will put 
everything between each comma into its own element and that element will that that list with all those elements in it will be assigned to the value so the variable short names so short names again this is Variables on the left-hand side, everything's going on on the right-hand side, and we simply are setting short names to whatever user input dot split does. And this I, is what it does. I do have one question about that, just because I saw it in our homework over the week. With the split function, you said the comma is put in there to show where the values are being separated. but I've seen the split function without anything in the parentheses. What, what does that mean in that case? That means that it is space delimited. So okay. we only have a, so here I have Gertrude comma, Sam comma, Ann comma, Joseph. I could take that, that comma out and I could just do user input dot split with nothing in, in between the open and close parentheses. So that would be empty. And then it would split it on a space. The default delimiter in Python for the split function is always a space. Okay, got it. Thanks. No problem. So, the first thing it tells me to do is it's delete, deleting the first element and changing the last element to Joe. So, how do I delete the first element? Well, I could do two things. I could pop it or I could explicitly delete it. I'm choosing to explicitly delete it. So I'm going to use the del keyword, and I'm going to say, ah, my bad, excuse me, I just realized. Here, we're just going to do it like this. Okay. My bad, we're going to start again. I had the wrong variable name. I would, uh, I would have failed the, the um, challenge. So let's start again. List basics. I enter Gertrude, Sam, Ann, and Joseph. I enter my user input. Now I have names equals user input dot split. So the rest of my script on the screen will work. So I'm going to delete names at zero, which means I'm removing Gertrude from the list. So what I am left with is Sam, Ann, and Joseph. And then I, I don't want Joseph there, I want Joe. So I'm going to take the last element, which in this case has an index of two, because remember we always start at zero, and I'm going to say names at index of two equals Joe. And Python will update this in place. So let's go out and take a look at 611. And I probably won't go through all of the challenges because there's a lot of them, but I do want to make sure I cover some. And if there's any in particular, any questions in particular that you have, let me know. So this is what basically we just had on the screen. And uh, let me edit the configuration. 611. I don't know why these never show up here in order. Okay, so we're going to go through our handy dandy debugger. And I'm on line one, and it's waiting for me to input something. So I'm going to input Okay, so I didn't put Gertrude, Sam, Ann, and Jeff. I can put anything. It's, it's my data, and the script will do the same thing as long as there's the right number of data elements. So I have done that. I'm going to step over and I have Lisa and Debbie and Millie. So now I'm going to split it. Whoops. Boy, I didn't read this over today. Split. Let's try this again. So we're going to say Lisa and Debbie Millie. Okay. So now when I split it, it's going to create a list. And if we go over here under frames and variables and we look at variables, names is in fact a list. PyCharm will show it to you in the correct 
syntax. So the square brackets around it and each element separated by a comma. I'm going to get the length. I'm going to delete the first one and I'm about to step off the end of my list, which is probably why I did that. So I believe that I changed this the last time to show an error. So this is what happens when you walk off the end of your list because you can do that in Python. You can do that in any language. Um, if I am telling it to go, I, I gathered the length here, which meant it was four. But when I said Dell names, it became a three element list. So now I'm saying four minus one is three. The index value is three. The latest index value can be two because we always start at zero. And so I am walking off the end of a list. And the reason I did this and I didn't change it back was to show this particular error. This particular error, this list assignment index out of range means you have walked off the end of your list. You are trying to access an element that is not in your list. I could have easily put a million in that and it would have done the same thing. So it has to be zero, one, or two at this point. So this is a logic error. And the way I fix this logic error is to get the length of the name after I have done the delete. So if I debug this one more time, it should work now. So OK, so now I've got four names. So I would be at 0, 1, 2, and 3. I have split it, so now I have an, uh, a list that is assigned to the names variable. I'm now going to delete the first item in name. So now I have Ann, Debbie, and Millie. Now I get the length. This is the point at which I should get the length for this because this is the final length. So I have a length of three. I'm going to say three minus one is two, which is the last. Um, index number for the list, I'm going to replace it with Joe. So now I have Ann, Debbie, and Joe. And I'm going to print my list, and I'm done. So that, the first time we ran it, there was an exception. But that exception was done as, a, as a, um, an intended logic error to show you why you might get an index out of bounds exception. So, uh, OK. So there are, there are more list methods than I can begin to talk about. Um, I have chosen four, and that's because these four are used in your labs this week. Count counts the number of items with a value of x, whatever. x can be anything. Sort sorts the list in order. This is very handy. You don't have to write your own sorting algorithm unless you really, really want to. The one that Python gives you is efficient and it's tested. You don't have to worry about writing your own code. Append adds an element to the end of the list. And reverse sorts elements in the list in reverse order. So those are four that you need for this week. But I encourage you to go out and start looking at the Python documentation. Python has really good documentation online. There are lots of other good resources about it. And this will kind of expand your knowledge. And for my students, I'm OK with that. I want them to go out and broaden their knowledge past what they're seeing in class. If there is a function, that Python provides that does exactly what you need, I would prefer that you use that rather than attempting to reinvent the wheel. So sort and reverse. So we're going to sort short names in reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to input something. Jan, Sam, Ann, Joe, and Todd is just a non-comma-delimited 
string so there are no commas in it. Now, Kalen, this answers your question that split just says split it on the on a space rather than on a, a an explicit delimiter. So um, we want to first sort it. So we're going to sort it in alphabetical order. And then we want to reverse sort it. So we're going to let Python sort it in reverse alphabetical order. And it is that simple. Python gives you these um, functions so you don't have to worry about doing them on your own. So it is just as simple as writing, as saying names.sort. Now, for it to sort properly, you're going to have to have elements of the same type. You'll notice here everything is a string. Because a list, you don't have to be type specific. You can put anything you want in a list. So that means if you're going to use sort or reverse, that you have to have your elements in the list of the same type. Now, I wasn't planning on going through this in code. The script is out there, but we do have a lot to do tonight, and I do want to take time to go over the labs and also to answer any questions you have about the games. So, challenge 6.3.3 is write a loop to print all elements in the hourly temperature, separate them with a dash and a greater than symbol surrounded by spaces. Now, why am I specifically going over this loops and lists? Because we already did a list. Well, because this one has something special. What it has is it, is it has the logic to stop at the very end of the list and not go on and do something else. So I'll show you what I mean. So I just have user input. Professor Lisa is sitting there. She's typing 90, 92, 94, and 95. So, this, is, this needs to be a list. I've just typed this in on the command line as a string. So what do I need to do? I need to split it. I don't have to worry about a delimiter because I didn't use the comma or any other character. And so I now have hourly temp set to a list of 90, 92, 94, 95. Okay, that's cool. We've done that. So now I want to print out the elements in a list separated by a dash and a greater than symbol, like an arrow. But I don't want to add that to the very after the very last one. So how do I prevent that from happening? Well, I prevent that from happening by use by, by getting the index and using the index to tell me where I am. So you'll notice in this for statement, I have four index in range len of hourly temp. So I have hourly temp. I'm going to get the length of it using the len function. And I'm going to let range say from 0 to length minus 1, because that's what range does, give me the index until I've hit the end. That's perfectly fine. So what am I going to do? Well, first of all, I wanted to talk about in because we've used it before, but when you're dealing with lists, always use the in operator. There are very few times when you wouldn't want to use the in operator. So what am I going to do when I get into the list? Well, first thing I have to do is the print hourly temp um, of index, comma, and then I only want to end it with a space. I don't want to end it with a new line, so I have to tell Python that. And that's done by end equal quote space quote. So now I have to check when it's appropriate to put that little arrow. Because I want the arrow between 90 and 92, between 92 and 94, and between 94 and 95. But I do not want it after 95. And in fact, if you do that in the, uh, in the lab that's similar to this, you're going to get an error. You're going to not get an error, but Pipe, uh, Zybooks isn't going to give you any points. So how do I do that? I say if the index is not equal to the length of hourly temp minus 1, which means this is the last element in the list, 
then I want to print that arrow and a space. Oh, and now we're starting. Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't set up the animation as well as I wanted to. So the first element happens, you are, um, it's 90, so we're going to print hourly temperature. And then we're also going to print the arrow because I am at element 0. Then I go to element 1, and I'm going to print 92. And then I am going to print the arrow because I am at index of 1. And 1 is not equal to the length of hourly temp, which is 4 minus 1. So it's not equal to 3. So now I've got index of 2, which is 94. I'm going to print out 94. I'm then going to print out the arrow. So 95 is the last one. I'm going to print that out. And then I stop. I'm done. Because when I get to this if index not equal to length of hourly temp minus 1, well, the index is 3. And len hourly temp minus 1 is 3. So index is no longer not equal. So index is equal to 3, which will not do that final print. So that's why I wanted to show you this challenge. OK. And the nice thing about the in operator is it always um, evaluates each element in order. Let's see what time is it. Yeah, we're going to keep going. Because we have to get to multidimensional lists. So we've done single dimensional lists. We've done, we've done just a row of things. But lists are so much more than a single row. If you have ever used an Excel spreadsheet, if you have ever used a table in, that's my Amazon device and she's driving me crazy. Um, I apologize. So, yeah. I'm going to go and plug it in a second if it does it again. So if you've ever used a spreadsheet, if you have ever used a table in a Microsoft Office document, then you have used a multidimensional list or a matrix. So, so they're very handy. And, and in fact, in um, coming up, in the files class, you're going to do a CSV file, a comma separated value file, that's going to be a multidimensional list. So how do I represent the t data in this table in a list format in Python? Well, it's actually a lot easier than it seems because it's always row and then column. So let me show you what I mean. The first row of this table is 10, 20, and 30. So I have an opening outer and closing outer square brackets. Those are in red. Then I now have the first row from that table, 10, 20, and 30. Now I have to separate these. Just like I have to separate every other list with commas, I have to separate multidimensional lists with commas. So every list inside the outer list has to be separated with a comma. So I'm going to give it a comma, and now I'm going to go to the next row. The next row is 40, 50, and 60. That's going to be my second element in my multi-list. And I've got to make sure I have that comma. And then I have 70, 80, and 90, which is going to be the final element in my multi-list. Now you'll notice there's no comma after that. That's because there's no other list or element in my multi-list that's going to show up. So this is how you represent that table into a multi-dimensional list. And we use these a lot. So nested loops. Why did I go from multi-dimensional lists to nested loops? Because nested loops are made for multi-dimensional lists. That's why. If you have something that has a row and a column and you have to loop through it, you have to have two loops. For every dimension in the list, you're going to need a loop. So if you have three-dimensional lists, 
you're going to need three loops. If you have four dimensional lists, I'm going to get a headache. But that's the rule. Every dimension of the list has to have its own for loop. So let's talk about nested lists really quick. So challenge, um, you're going to print two-dimensional list uh, by row and column. So I'm going to input, I, I'm inputting some numbers. I have one space, two space, three, comma, two space, four space, six, comma, three space, six space, nine. Well, why would I, why would I, um, why would I mix commas and spaces? Well, I will mix them because I want to separate my rows from my columns. And the rows are, are delineated by a comma, and the columns are not, or the cells are not. They're delineated by spaces. So I'm going to split my user input, and I'm going to get a single dimensional list with three elements. And the three elements are still strings. They're 1, 2, 3, comma, 4, 5, 6, comma, 3, 6, 9. So now I need a place to hold this stuff. I, I'm about to create this multidimensional list matrix thing. So the first thing I have to do is I have to create an empty list. I'm calling the empty list table. And that table will eventually hold my multidimensional list. Now, I am specifically creating it outside the for loop because I want to use it when the for loop is over. And if I define it inside the for loop, it doesn't exist. Remember we talked about scopes last week? For loops have scope. If it's tabbed in under the for loop, that means that it is, um, sorry, that means that it is not available outside of the loop except if it's been defined outside the loop. So I need tables to be available later so it's defined outside the loop. Now I have this four, and I have four row underscore counter in range len rows, okay? So rows is my variable up on the second line, and it is a single dimensional list that's holding three strings. So I'm going to go 0, 1, and 2. That's pretty standard for the outer loop. Now I want to deal with each individual cell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split. Oh, my bad. And you get to see the whole thing. All right. I'm going to split. Hold on. I don't know why I didn't catch this. We'll go back and start it real quick. Okay, I don't want those in there. So, let's play it again. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. Okay. So, we're creating our empty list. All right, so I am splitting line. So, what the heck did I do? I'm sorry. Okay, I need to fix this again. I don't know why I didn't catch that. My apologies again. I used this slide for two semesters and I just caught the issue. Okay. So, I promise not to start this a fourth time. So, the cells is row counter, and we're splitting what's in that row. Okay, we're going to start it one more time. So, my outer loop is the row, and my inner loop is a cell. We're going to evaluate each cell for each row. So, my outer loop is for the row, 
and the inner loop is for the cells. So my cells will have one, two, and three for the first time through the loop. Now, I need to do something here. I need to create a new list. That new list is going to be, um, yeah, the new list is going to be one, two, and three. So, so I say for cell counter in range lens cells, I'm going to um, I don't know what I did on that line. I apologize. So what I'm doing here is I am creating for each particular row a list. So you'll see that we go through 2, 4, 2, 2, 4, 2, 4, 6, 3, 3, 6, 3, 6, 9. And then I'm going to print them out later on. I don't know why this slide is so messed up. I apologize for as messed up as it is. This is what you're supposed to print out at the end. And then for some reason, I don't know why. Yeah, we're just going to do this in code and make it a little less crazy. So this is 651. I apologize, I will fix that slide. 651, okay. Here is the correct code. Let's just do it this way, 651. Okay. So here is my code. I'm going to input something. I'm going to populate the tables. I am then going to create a row. I'm going to populate that row and then I'm going to put that row into the table. And then I'm going to do another loop, another nested loop to output it properly. So let's walk through the right code. And it's going to ask me to put in something. So what it will, I'm going to say one space, two space, three, comma, four space, five space, six, comma, seven space, eight space, nine. So this is what I have. I put in, you just saw, now I'm splitting it so I have a single dimensional list. And I want to turn that single dimensional list into a multi-dimensional list. So the way I do this is I define my table. Okay, for row counter in range length of rows. So this is row counter of zero. My cells, now rows of row counter, the beginning one is right here. So my cell, cells is going to be one, two, and three. So I have my table up here that I'm going to store the final values in, but I need this interim row. I need a, a place to store each value until they're ready to go in to the table list. So I create a variable inside the for loop called row, and now I'm going to say for cell in cell counter in range length of cells because cells has now got its own list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to row dot append. Row doesn't have anything in it. I have no index values to put something in. So the only thing I can do with row right now is I can append to it. That's often what you will do when you are populating a list. Whoops. Okay, so we're going to be four cells, uh, let's see, variables. So here are all my variables. So in cells, I have one, two, and three. And right now I have one because I, I stepped into onto line 10 and it converted the cell counter. So let's do that again. Here I have cells of cell counter. Cell counter is 1, which means it's going to be the value 2. And then I'm going to do it one more time for the value 3. So you'll see that row 
is now 1 comma 2 comma 3. So it's three integers. And now I'm going to append that to row. Again, table is currently empty. The only thing you can do with an empty list is append to it or delete the whole thing. So tables, you will see now, has the first element as 1, 2, and 3. So we're going to do this again for 3, sorry, 4, 5, 6. And then when we're done, you will, you're about to see table change to having two elements in it. Are you still there, Kaylin? Oh, we have three attendees now. Um, and then I'm just going to do a continue here. Uh, where is it? I'm going to just run to this one. Okay. I heard a beat and I thought, oh, did I lose him? So, okay. So this is step into, I want to step out of, run to cursor. Here, we'll put the cursor here and we'll run to cursor. Okay. So now you see that table has three elements, and those three elements are in fact uh, are in fact lists. So we have table that's a list of lists. So now what do I want to do? Well, I want to now print them out with pipes in between them with a space. Otherwise, if, if it's not the last one, if it is the last one, then I'm just going to print out the number itself. So I have an outer for loop and an inner for loop. Again, I have a two-dimensional list. I'm going to have two for loops. One's always going to be nested inside the other. And I'm basically saying for row in table, and I can call it whatever I want, but row, row makes sense to me. I'm going to say index comma cell in enumerate row. Now enumerate is a really it's it's a really neat thing that also deals with the fact that Python allows me and its own programmers to return multiple values from a function. So what enumerate does is it says gives me give me the index and the value. And I'm going to give you a place to put them. I'm going to give you a variable called index to put the index of the row of, of a value. And I'm going to have you use, sorry, I'm going to use cell to input the value for the element that I'm at. So enumerate is very handy if you want to get both. So I'm going to say, so right now I have index of zero and cell, cell, the cell value is one. I'm going to basically say if my index is not at the end of this particular row, then I'm going to print cell, I'm going to pipe it to, I'm going to put a pipe in between it and then I'm going to put a space. So I just said one and then a pipe. So now I'm on index one and cell two. So I'm going to print two and a pipe. Now I'm on index of two and the cell value is three. Well, zero, one, and two, I'm at the end. So I'm not going to print the pipe in between it. And I'm just going to print three. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to come up back up to that top of that the, the outer loop because I finished with that row. So now I'm going to go to the next row. And the next row is um, three, four, sorry, four, five, six. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to take each particular cell value and I'm going to print it out until I get to the last value where I'm just going to print the cell value instead of the cell value and the pipe. And we're going to do it all one more time. So the important thing to remember is you have to complete the inner loop before you go back up to the outer loop. So it really is a smaller loop and then a bigger loop. And every time you hit the top of the bigger loop, you figure out whether you're going to go into the smaller loop. So, and I know it's, okay. All right, so now let's go back to the slides. 
Why did that one get? Don't know what's going on. Okay. So, dictionaries. Dictionaries are a whole new concept for us. Dictionaries are what they call an associative container. And what that means is it doesn't have it doesn't have an index. There's no concept of an index when you're dealing with a dictionary. A dictionary deals with key value pairs and it is an unordered collection. Again, there is no index. And what a dictionary allows you to do is it allows you to associate meaning with a value. And you need to understand dictionaries because you're going to have to have a dictionary that works and functions properly in your game. So, how do I know it's a dictionary? Because you've got curly brackets. Okay? There are members, and those members have keys and values. So when I look at my dict here, I see the word name, I see it colon, and then I see the word Lisa. So, the key is always to the left of the colon, and the value is always to the right. Just like a variable is to the left of a single equal sign, and the value is to the right of a single equal sign. Dictionary, the key is to the left, and the value is to the right. So the value is always to the right when you're dealing in Python. So I have created a, a variable called my dict. I have name and value. I have I have name is Lisa and age is 42 and amount is 3.14. I don't have to be type specific in my dictionary. The keys do not have to be do not have to be words. They don't have to be strings, um, but they do have to be valid. So, key and value. The key is name, and the value is Lisa. The key is age. And the value is 42. The key is amount. And the value is 3.14. So those are keys and values. Now, dictionary crud. Just like we have list crud, create, read, update, delete, we have dictionary crud. So how do I create a dictionary? I can populate an empty dictionary, just like I did a list. Curly bracket, nothing between it right curly bracket. I can create a populated one where I already have all the elements and or some of the elements. When I read it, the reading is going to look a little different because in reading a dictionary you don't use curly brackets, you use square brackets. But what's inside the square bracket is the key and that key will get you to the value. So I can update and what I can do here is I can change the name to Fred. And I can also append a new key value pair. So the way I do that is for a dictionary, the append method takes a, an argument. And that argument is the key. And then when I have equal val, the value is on the right hand side as always. The variable, or in this case, the new key for that dictionary is on the left hand side. And I can also just remove a whole dictionary. So how do I iterate over something without an order? Well that's how this is how you iterate over a dictionary. First I'm going to input a string. C is 136, I is 124, US. Now you'll notice that I have commas and colons because I am probably going to split the difference. So the first thing I have to do is I have to split it out by the comma. Because again, this is kind of rows and values, but it doesn't have an index. Um, and I, what I want to do is I want to turn all this into a dictionary so it has meaning. So I'm going to create an empty dictionary. I'm going to say country pop, that's just population. And then I'm going to say four pair in entries. So entries is my list. And so I want a pair. So each element in that list is going to be a pair. And I'll, now I'm going to split that pair by the colon. So what do I get? I get a list with C and 136. 
for the first one. Now I'm going to say country pop split pair of zero equals split pair of one. So what I've done here is I've added split pair of zero and I've given it the value of split pair of one. So country pop becomes C colon 136. It's now a it's I've now added those elements to a dictionary. So I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm going to grab the next thing. The next thing is I-124. I'm now going to add it to my country pop dictionary, and you'll see C colon 136 comma I-142. That comma is important. A comma has to be used to, or comma is used to split the elements in a dictionary. Split the name value pair. So I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm going to get US equals 318. I'm going to now add it to the dictionary. I'm going to do it one more time. And I'm going to add it to the final dictionary. So that is how I iterate over a dictionary. That's how I create a list. Sorry, that's how I create a dictionary from a list. So we go back up to the top. We're all done with that. So now I want to iterate over the dictionary that I've just created. How do I do that? I iterate over the dictionary that I've created by using a function called items. The dictionary, dictionaries in Python have functions that you can use on them. So in this case, we have items. And what items does is it returns both the key and the value. So when I say for country comma pop in country pop dot items, what Python is going to give me is it's going to give me the first, on the first way, first go through the loop, it's going to give me C136. It's going to give me C is the name and 136 is the value. On the second iteration through the loop, it's going to say I and 124 and so on. So items is very important. I'm going to say print country has pop people. So whoops, my bad. One too many times. Okay. Boy, don't give me a keyboard tonight. Let's do this real quick. It will catch up in just a second. Exciting movie for tonight. Okay, one more through this loop and then we're going to start on the next one. Okay, so now I'm going to go into my next loop, and I'm going to use the items function. So I want to say print country has pop people. So why didn't I? I apologize. I don't have the entire thing here. I should have had an output. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get each key value pair, and then I'm going to just use country, which is the key, and pop, which is the value. And items always returns it in that order. It always returns key and value. And in this for loop, country and pop are just variable names. There's nothing special about them. They could have been Bert and Ernie. They could have been Fred and Wilma. It doesn't matter. So. Um, a diction, 
A dictionary can be anything including another dictionary. You will need this for your game, okay? So if I have a dictionary of dictionaries, I can say my key value is let's say my room name. Then I have a colon and then I have a dictionary. And in this dictionary, the second, the inner dictionary for room one, I have that I can go south and it will take me to room two, or I can go north and it will take me to room three. At least that's what I want it to mean, and I will write my code to mean that. And then you can do the same thing for another room and another room and up to all of your rooms. So it says what this is saying is I have room one, and over here are all the directions that room one can go. And remember, this is an inner dictionary. So after I'm done, I have to end that dictionary with a comma. So I can go down to the new key value pair. Room two is a key. The value is a dictionary. The information in that dictionary is north is a key. And room one is a value, which I want to give it meaning, saying from room two, I can go north to room one. And that is what your code will do. But this is important. You need a dictionary of dictionaries for your game to allow your players to properly navigate with the least amount of code. If you can put the code into a structure and then write, um, sorry, if you can put the data into a structure and then write code to deal with the structure, your program is more flexible. Because all you have to do if you're going to add a ninth room to your game is to add a ninth room here. If you're going to add a tenth room, add a tenth room in that room's dictionary. So you have made your game expandable. Okay, so let's talk about the function, sorry, the labs. Um, 6.12 is very amount of input data pseudocode. All right, so this is the pseudocode and basically we're gonna have user input. Um, we're gonna split that. Um, we're gonna convert the strings to integers. So I want a for loop. And in that for loop, I'm going to go through all of my tokens, and I'm going to append them to the input data because I have created an empty list on this line for input data. So then I'm going to get the average and the max. So I'm going to say the average value is the sum of input data divided by the length of input data. Pretty simple. And then I'm going to set the max value, and I'm going to get the max of input data. Now, max might just be a built-in function. You might not have to write your own max. So maybe you should go out and look at that list, uh, at the URL that was in one of the earlier slides, to see if there's like a max function that you can use. And then you're just going to output the average value and the max value. So sort, filter and sort a list. Remember when I said that sort and reverse were probably going to be your friends? This is where you're going to use them in 6.13. All right, so I'm going to input a value from a user. I've got tokens is going to be the input user dot split. Um, I'm going to set input data equal to an empty list. I'm going to go through each of the tokens. If the token is greater than zero, then append that token to input data because I don't want zeros. Now I'm going to sort. There is a function called sort for lists, and that's what you want to use. And then I want to output the values, but I do not want to output the values. Um, I don't want to output them on separate lines. I want to output the values on the same line. And I want to make sure that I don't put a space after the last one. So remember that the two times that we did earlier in this, where I said this is how you avoid putting the arrow after the last value, that's what you need to do here. That's what you need to do in 6.13. A lot of students get frustrated with that. Go back and look at that particular example with the arrows in it and the, and the temperatures because that's the logic you need to use. Okay, 6.18, word frequencies. 
Remember when I said there was this count function and I haven't done anything with it since it? This is where you want to use the count function. Okay, so I'm going to input some values. I'm going to split those values. And then I'm going to say for index and user sentence, output user sentence index and the count of the user sentence index. So basically what I'm saying is I get this user sentence by splitting something that I've typed in, a bunch of words. And then I'm going to iterate over that list. And for every, every letter, or sorry, every word in that list, I'm going to output their frequencies. And I think this is the last one for tonight. Replacement words. So we're going to have word pairs, which is going to be an empty dictionary. So this is our lab for dictionaries. I'm going to input word pairs. I'm going to input name, Lisa, age, 42, or whatever. So now I have to put the word pairs into a dictionary. Well, we did that with the country population one. And so we basically have an index, and we're going to roll through that index. And in this case, instead of having a, 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 a letter, colon, and a, vet, and a number, what we're going to have is just a bunch of things in a list. So what we want to do is say position 0 is a key, position 1 is a value, position 2 is a key, position, position 3 is a value. So that's what I have to do here. So I'm going to make sure I increment by 2 every time I hit the top of the loop. So if you don't remember how to do that, go and look at the range operator. Go and look at the, the definition for the range operator, and it will tell you how to set it up so you can increment by 2. So now I'm going to get a user sentence from input. And I'm going to say for original word, comma, new word, in word pair, items. So this is where I use that items function. So I can get back the key and the value. And then I'm going to set user sentence is replace original word with new word in user sentence. So the replace happens because I'm actually taking the, um, the value, the key, and I am replacing it with I'm replacing the value of that key with um, the user sentence. And then I'm just going to output it. So this is our creating a dictionary. We're going to do a little work on the dictionary by replacing some things. And then we're going to output it. Oh, word frequencies. Didn't I just do this one? These lot slides are a little more messed up than I like. Okay, varied amount, filter sort, word frequencies, and replacement. I must have gone back. My apologies. Okay, I know I've gone over as usual, but not too bad. What would you like to talk about? Would you like to talk about anything? Does any Open the mics up. Does anybody have any questions? Do you guys want to go through um, any dictionary code? Um, I think I'm I think I'm good, honestly. That was okay. pretty helpful. It cleared up a lot of the things that you know I was not quite getting from the readings. That's um, good. Yeah, the the lectures are helpful because sometimes reading just on a screen for an hour straight. It, gets monotonous. <laughs> yeah, and my mind doesn't work like that. I'm not a reading, writing learner. So yeah, no, I, I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah, I, have to do. I have to see it, hear it, and do it before I learn it. So I'm glad you found this helpful. I will be putting this up. Oh, hi, Anita. I'm not, I didn't hear you announce yourself. I'm glad you're good, too. Um, so I will be putting this up. Uh, tomorrow on the YouTube page, and it will have all of the .py files you see in PyCharm. So reach out, Kaylin. I, Anita, I don't think you're in my class, but Kaylin, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions, okay? 
Have a good evening, everyone.